welcome. Uh, welcome to 2022. Go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, the, we recently took a trip to New Orleans. The core team, those people who were prayerfully considering going to New Orleans. And so uh, when I got back and shared a little bit about how that went with the staff, uh, Smith asked if I wanted to give an update. I thought that'd be great. Good opportunity to put these uh, same things in front of us that we've been talking about and a way to make the body more broadly aware of kind of what's going on uh, with, with our plans for church planting in New Orleans. So in 1 Timothy chapter 3, this has just been such a pivotal passage for my own thinking on what the church is, why church planting is crucial, why having a, a home base here at Grace Bible Church is essential, and really a, a commentary for all churches on what the church is, what the church must be, why the church is so important in God's plan. 1 Timothy 3, starting in verse 14, Paul says to Timothy, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household or family of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. We uh, looked at this passage months ago now in our series on ecclesiology. But this passage is so helpful when we consider church planting because it ties together three of the church's chief burdens, things that God has given us as his family, as his household to concern ourselves with, things that we love to concern ourselves with and consider and labor for. And those three things, you'll see them laid out in verse 15 because these instructions to Timothy couldn't wait for Paul to arrive back in Ephesus, he wrote the letter to go before him. Verse 15 says, so that one will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. So our conduct matters. These are urgent instructions to inform the church how the church must be conducting itself, how each member of the church must be conducting himself as a part of God's family. And so our conduct is that first chief burden, as well as what Paul says that follows, which is the church of the living God. So he defines what the church is. Uh, the household of God is the church of the living God the pillar and support of the truth. And so just in those few phrases, God's household being the church of the living God, which is also a pillar and support of the truth, the pillar and support of the truth. In those few phrases, we see that God's reputation as father, because he has a household and family, he is God the father. God's reputation as living, as opposed to non-existent, dead, not living, like an idol. God's reputation as Father, as the God who lives, is dependent on or tied to the church's conduct. And so the church's conduct is a, is a burden of ours. God's reputation is a burden of ours, as well as God's truth. The church is the pillar and support of the truth. The pillar and support. Not one of many, but the only one. Uh, this is illustrated so well in Acts time and again as it's demonstrated over and over and over through the miraculous gifts, the spiritual gifts that are given to the church. Uh, what's happening all throughout the book of Acts is you see a transition taking place 
from God establishing his reputation with the Jewish leadership and associating himself with the temple that is now moved to God associating himself with the church. This new man, this new organism that God is forming mixed of Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles, uh, completely new, not founded on Mosaic law, but submitted to the teaching of the apostles. This is what in Acts 2 they committed themselves to. And so the church, the way we should think about this, if the church doesn't properly uphold God's reputation, God's name, and God's truth in the world, then God's reputation or his name and his truth go unrepresented. It is the church's job. It's not a campus ministry's job. It's not a biblical counseling training center's job. It's not a missions organization's job to uphold God's name and truth in the world. That is the exclusive responsibility of the local church, of local churches. And so, as you know, uh, these are, are really exciting times for Grace Bible Church to be thinking about these things in church planting um, until 1 Timothy 3, 15 is happening perfectly everywhere, then there will be a need for church planting. There will be a need for church strengthening. There will need, be a need for churches reproducing itself in the world. And so that's what we've set our sights on, uh, even in a couple places. Now, uh, close to home in Gilbert, as well as almost 1,500 miles away in New Orleans. And so the, this is incredibly exciting uh, for me for a long time, really, since uh, God saved me in 2008. This has been a desire of mine to see the gospel go to New Orleans. And since I've been here for 13 years plus now, I've been learning more and more about how to actually get the gospel to New Orleans well in a way that's sustainable, in a way that's excellent, in a way that communicates God's wisdom and does these things, rightly represents him and his truth in the world. So we're planning on that. We've been planning on that uh, for several months now. And recently, the, uh, the team took a, a trip to New Orleans Several of us left um, and, and visited New Orleans. It was really important to me that we get there soon so that people could see um, what the city's like and think more knowledgeably, uh, pray with a, an informed mind on, on the things that are there. Uh, and I've been just kind of living in this, this, you know, trajectory for, for several months, laboring uh, for these things. I talked to lots of people who want to know, hey, what's going on uh, with New Orleans, how things come in, and it's easy for me to forget. You know, everybody's not a part of those meetings, those conversations, uh, so this is a really good opportunity to just uh, not only tell you about the trip, but sort of what's been happening since June of, of last year. Uh, first, let me introduce you to uh, our team, and, and we've got plenty of pictures, so this will be a, a lot more visual than usual. Uh, our team consists of about 13 households, that's uh, singles and families. And so Derek and Pam Robinson, you see their uh, family pictured there, their children, their five kids, Kess, Lee, Amara, Jehu, and Manoa. Also, uh, Judy Heddens, who is Derek's mom, recently uh, moved from Chicago. She's uh, tagging along with, with the Robinsons, thankfully, adding to our, our team. Also, Diana Allen, pictured there with uh, my youngest son, Nishan, that's in New Orleans uh, from the recent trip. He's very comfy, you can tell. Also, Kyle and Ashley Frazee are part of that, that group. And their four children, Jackson, Harper, Hudson, and Rowan. 
Ryan and Christina Reed and their five children, Toby, Peyton, Israel, Milo, and Clancy. Micah Britton is a part of that team. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can go to the next slide. That's the wrong slide. There's a better picture of Micah. There we go. All right. Micah Britton's a part of that team. Also, uh, a seventh household, Nick and Brittany Dudley with their children, their two, Zakai and Milo, or Gimli, as he's uh, affectionately called, Gimli. <laughs> uh, eight, Rachel Hornack is a part of that group as well. Matt and Janelle Schneider and their three children, Uriah, Faith, and Lydia, and they're fostering as well currently. So if you see them, they'll have a, a fourth in tow, uh, baby Daniel. Jackson and Ashley Kennedy and their three children, Addie, Caleb, and Eliana. Steve and Carla Walker, their three, Christian, Eric, and Sydney, and I think my family's next. Obviously, we're a part of uh, that same group and our five, Chloe, Obadiah, Jonah, Ezekiel, and Michonne. And one who's uh, not pictured here, a uh, single gal, Marissa Frazee, who is Kyle's sister. She's been uh, a part of that group as well. Uh, the Frazies uh, kind of roped her in to prayerfully considering as they started prayerfully considering. Uh, she's a member at Santan Bible Church, uh, a like-minded church in the East Valley. And so she's been uh, participating in, in what we've been doing as well. Uh, there are a few others who've expressed interest, um, and, and those are ongoing conversations uh, that I'm having uh, with them and, you know, just discerning uh, desire and uh, preparedness for, for this work. So as you notice, that's a, a lot of children. Um, it's about 21 adults and 31 children. So if all of these families came day one, uh, which is not what I'm anticipating, but if that did happen, we'd have a, a robust children's ministry day one. Uh, there's a spectrum, all of these families, you know, when you, uh, when you see them walking around uh, here, all of them are not equally uh, committed to coming just yet. So there's a spectrum somewhere from we're all in and just give us a date and we'll start packing to I'm not really sure I should go. Um, not really sure I want to live in New Orleans yet, but I do love the glory of God. I do love God's word. I do love the church and want to see a church planted in New Orleans. And so until you guys leave or until God makes it clear that we're not going, we will prayerfully consider uh, joining you in this work and we're supporting. Um, that's probably uh, one of the, the sweet families in that vein would be uh, Kyle and Ashley Frazee. They host our uh, team gatherings so far. Uh, they open their home and just do an excellent job of practicing hospitality. And they've got the, uh, the space in their yard for kids to be outside and busy while the adults are busy with other things and, and planning and talking church planting. So there's a spectrum there. You can be praying for those families, uh, talking to those families about their, their desire and how they're working through those things, that would be uh, really exciting for you to hear from them as well as for them to be able to catch you up to speed on where they're at as a family. Um, our, our gatherings, let me just tell you what we've been doing. Um, after this was announced uh, from up front, kind of for the first time formally. Uh, we had three interest meetings for our church over a two-week period. 
uh, people came to our home and uh, we basically gave a shortened version of uh, what was presented to the elders uh, some few years ago, how uh, a church plant in New Orleans might look. And so that included some general information about the city, uh, why this was important. Obviously, the church has grown quite a bit since 2009 when Smed preached uh, the five-sermon series on missions and church planting, which was so formative in the life of our church for understanding how we want to think about missions, how we want to think about church planting. And so uh, we gave a general overview of what our church's mission strategy is, what our approach is, and how we would like to, to plant a church. Uh, the way that we're choosing to do it is not the only way that churches get planted. Uh, to take a portion of your church who's already familiar with body life, loves the doctrine, uh, is practicing the very things you want to see implemented somewhere else. That's not the only way to do it. That's how uh, we've considered doing it. That's how we love doing it, how we want to do it. And so catching people up to speed a little bit on, on those things was a part of those initial interest meetings. And then we just put in front of uh, people to pray and to consider whether this was something that was uh, desirable to them. And so from that, the families that, you, uh, that I just named were uh, a part of that group. And so after those initial interest meetings, we uh, started gathering in July of last year. And really what, what I had in mind for these gatherings is to get all of us united around the same things uh, and prepared in the same ways so that there's no surprises when we leave and go to New Orleans, right? Uh, we are all already at Grace Bible Church and in the normal ebb and flow of body life, but we don't want to make any assumptions either. Uh, we don't want to make any assumptions about leaders leading the church plant. We don't want to make any assumptions about people going, uh, how we think ministry should be run. Uh, things will not look in New Orleans exactly how they look here on a Sunday or in a, a given month. Uh, all of those things are really dependent on the needs of the people there who are a part of the church. Uh, the goal is always to feed sheep and so before we go, we need to be like-minded. We need to be unified. We need to have some period of time of thinking the same way about the same things. And so at these gatherings, uh, what they've included, they've been once a month, every last Saturday of the month. They've included a potluck-style meal. Somebody takes the lead on bringing the main dish, tells everybody else what to contribute. Uh, we sing together. There's a short time of teaching. Uh, we pray together. And even for the children, all of those children you saw listed, uh, Tanya Jolly has gratefully, thankfully taken the lead on training our children, which was, you know, I would have been content with mere child care that allowed the adults to focus on other things. But Tanya, uh, having been someone who has had to relocate, uh, knows some of the difficulties of uh, not just the, the parents, but also the children. And so she has uh, her own burden to make sure that the children are prepared as well. And so she's been teaching them, uh, playing games with them, along with uh, Acadia and Bree and some other young ladies in 414, who've kind of teamed up with her and helped her in that. Uh, during our times for teaching, just some things as I have spent months now, uh, years, just meeting different church planters, uh, finding out from them what's been hard, what things do you wish you would have done differently, uh, what would you do if you got a chance to do it again, what would you put in front of the people going, what didn't work well, all of those details 
involved in church planning. Uh, I've tried to put in front of the core team things that are going to help them think well uh, about church planning to discern their own motives and what are essential foundational convictions that are going to sustain us decades, Lord willing, uh, generations into the future uh, from now. And so some of the things, just to give you an idea of what we've already discussed together, the first uh, meeting, we talked about wrong motivations for church planting. What are wrong motivations for church planting? Uh, Some of the things on that list were don't go because of the, the local cuisine. And that made a lot more sense on the other side of the trip, why you don't go for food. Because <laughs> that can be enticing if you're, if you're going to New Orleans. So uh, I want a smaller church. Uh, I want a smaller ministry. I'm looking for a position in the church that I can't fill here. Uh, you can read more about those wrong motivations up on the uh, church website, uh, New Orleans has uh, its own blog and sort of its own landing page now. Uh, You can find that under the ministries or the blogs tab on our website. And so what I've been uh, wanting to do is just as often as I can take what we're discussing as a core team and uh, put them in article format for our church and those who uh, have even heard about us from outside our body and had some interest, um, you'll be encouraged to know Grace Bible Church isn't the only church invested in New Orleans. There are other churches in the Expositor Seminary Network who uh, have been thinking about New Orleans for a long time, and there's this opportunity that has arisen that they are really excited about. Uh, seeing a church in New Orleans and wanting to know how they can support us, sort of waiting for the uh, the green light from us in a lot of ways, um, as well as uh, people who just listen to our church's teaching from outside of here, people that uh, I had no idea existed until uh, we announced New Orleans publicly. And then I got a call and giving... <laughs> um, monetarily to to this work that I was completely unaware of. And so it started to even build some sweet relationships that way. So people are are praying and eager and excited and thankful for what our church is doing in this regard. Some other things that we started talking about are what I'm calling ministry sustaining convictions. Ministry sustaining convictions. These are things that are ministry sustaining convictions, wherever you go in whatever ministry you're involved in, if you're going to labor uh, for a long time, for God's sake, then you have to be convinced of these things. And so what we've talked about so far are the primacy of God's glory, that everything we do, uh, everything for which we labor is that God's glory. Nothing else is more ultimate and essential than that. Also, the necessity of the local church, we've discussed. The church, even as we saw here in 1 Timothy, is absolutely essential to to really what God is doing in the world. No other organization, no other individual can accomplish what God has tasked the church with accomplishing, discipling nations. Uh, The quality of God's word is obviously crucial. What is God's word? What do we believe about God's word? How should we think about God's word? Um, Those are things that are really undergirding everything you hear here and everything we do here on a Sunday. And uh, the way you see ministries played out, we're convinced that God's word is infallible. It is authoritative. It is clear. It is without error. It's perfect, it's wise, and so that should be uh, evident in what we're doing. We look to God's word for help, for instruction, for counsel. No one else has uh, the ultimate voice in the church, and yet for for a church plant, these are good qualities to revisit. Everything we do as 
uh, a new fledgling church needs to be centered on the word of God. God's voice needs to have primary place in the church. And also the regularity of teaching was uh, what we talked about the last time we met in November. Uh, the regularity of teaching. What We looked at the uh, legacy of teaching in the New Testament church. We talked a little bit about uh, the importance of teaching, uh, even from 1 Timothy 1.5, if you want to turn in your Bibles that are still open there, Paul lays out really succinctly what is the aim of all biblical instruction, all biblical teaching. Um, as you hear this, as you hear the sermon in, in an hour from now, what should you be thinking, what should you be aiming at that I'm going to be aiming at and preaching to you? <laughs> 1 Timothy 1.5, but the goal of our instruction is love. It's love. That is the goal of our instruction. That is the goal of my instruction now. That will be the goal of my instruction in an hour during main service. The goal of the instruction is love. You need to be better equipped to love. And primarily, as is laid out in the rest of the book, that is the church is primarily in view. Not just any kind of love, but it's love that comes from particular places. Namely, a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So biblical instruction should be purifying your inner life so that your heart increases in purity. Your conscience increases in its goodness and that your faith increases in sincerity. Now, we need to have our sights firmly set on that, even as we plan for New Orleans. And so teaching in however ministry looks in New Orleans, you can bet that teaching is going to be central. It's foundational. Everything else that we do as a church, even the life of the members and the encouragement, uh, the kind acts and time between members spent, those things will hinge on how effective the teaching is, how effective the goal of biblical instruction is reached. Uh, we skipped December. We are in New Orleans during December, so we didn't meet last month. And this month, we'll actually take a, a, a pause on discussing these ministry sustaining convictions, and we're reading David Doran's book, for the sake of his name, uh, together. An excellent book on missions uh, that puts things in front of us that we need to be thinking about as uh, a missions endeavor, planning a church in New Orleans. So that's a little bit about our, our gatherings. That's how those things uh, look currently. Uh, you can continue praying for us as we're gathering and, you know, the first of every month, you can ask us how the, how the meetings went since you know those are happening. It was important to me, as I mentioned, to, to take a trip to New Orleans. Uh, the only people who are a part of the core team that had, had actually ever been there were myself and Emily, the Robinsons, and the Frazies. Uh, we went with the Frazies back in February after the Courageous Churchmen Conference, and they got to see the city. But outside of that, no one had, had even been before. And so for the trip, uh, a few of us drove. You can, you can go to the next slide. Uh, D-Rob, Micah, Jackson, and myself, we all drove from New Orleans. Uh, that was... Not only did it cut down on uh, the cost of a plane ticket, but we got to uh, make a couple key stops on the way. We spent some time in New Orleans, or in Houston, rather, with my family. We stayed with them, uh, with my parents, at their house, and we got to visit the uh, Houston TES campus, uh, Founders Baptist. And so we spent the day with their 
elders talking about church planting. As uh, some of you know, they are planting a church in Katy, Texas. And so uh, Darren Roberts, who actually came from GIBC in Jupiter, moved to Houston, uh, is spending time in Houston with that leadership and with those uh, elders. And they're taking uh, a group of people who've been commuting from Katy, Texas, um, over an hour to Spring, Texas, where Founders Baptist is. They're taking a group and planting a church in Katy. And so we, we got some time, uh, we got to spend some time with them and talking about different things having to do with church planning. That was an incredibly uh, encouraging time with them. And then we went to New Orleans and uh, picked up the other four adults and two babies. So total, it was eight of us, eight adults, two infants, and we spent Thursday to Sunday in the city. This is a map of the city of New Orleans. And so uh, the city's not very big at all. Uh, its population is around the size of Mesa. So it's not, not very big. Um, I've got plenty of pictures, and this would just kind of be a guide for me as, uh, as we move forward. You can see on the next slide where we're aiming at in the city, that red box. That is New Orleans East. I grew up in New Orleans East and left for college in 2008, 2004, excuse me. Uh, not that young. Uh, left in 2004 for college with no plans to return. And as they started to uh, tear down lower income areas, uh, lower income housing areas uh, in different parts of the city, people from those areas started to move a little bit more to New Orleans East, uh, where there was housing that was not much, not much more expensive than, than where they were coming from. Uh, after Katrina in 2006, the East has not really recovered uh, from Hurricane Katrina. It's been uh, one of the few areas that uh, hasn't really risen back to its former, former state. And so there are about 90,000 people in that area, though, um, some who've, who came back after Katrina, some who've uh, moved there since, uh, with, with really not, not many options for, for churches. Uh, and if, if you take churches that have uh, the, what we believe about God's sovereignty and salvation, churches that share our view of the local church and shepherding, um, churches that preach expositorily um, through scripture, verse at a time, churches that practice church discipline, um, churches that embrace the sufficiency of scripture for counseling, right, biblical counseling, and not an integrated approach with psychology, uh, really, there, there aren't any churches in New Orleans East like that at all. Um, and in, in the entire city, there, there may be one, maybe two uh, similar that are far enough away from New Orleans East that people from New Orleans East wouldn't likely travel. Uh, if they're taking public city transit especially, uh, they wouldn't be traveling to these other places that are mid-city or in the uh, uptown area. If you see where the, the Mississippi River that runs straight through the city, sort of where it comes down into a bowl shape, a U, uh, if you drew a, a straight line across the top of the Mississippi, uh, you would get mid-city just above that line, and then on the bottom left, section of that U would be the uptown uh, Carrollton area. 
And even though if you were, you were here, you would travel 20 minutes, no problem. It wouldn't feel very far. Uh, in New Orleans, that, that feels like a, a good distance. Probably something like driving from here to Glendale a good year is how that would at least feel. And so that's not a, a likely trek for people from New Orleans East, especially if uh, as many people are dependent on public city transportation. So we're aiming for New Orleans East. You can go to the next slide. Uh, we got there on a Thursday. Sorry, that's Micah sleeping again. You can go to the next slide. Uh, that was the group that went. Uh, the first, first night we got in, we left the airport, went to a place called Dragos. And the, uh, I guess their claim to fame is that they are the first restaurant uh, to serve charbroiled oysters. Um, and I have to give a plug. <laughs> uh, Pam's brother, Mark Weens, has a uh, food channel. He's kind of a professional eater. And you can see what these charbroiled oysters look like in real time on a video that he and D-Rob were in together. Uh, and he'll show you how that whole process looks. You can find him. You can look him up on YouTube. Um, you can go to the next slide. Those are oysters. There's so much butter <laughs> that they just serve bread with it. So you can dip it in the, the, the butter that's left on the plate there. And we just had mounds of, of charbroiled oysters that first night that we were there. Next slide. More food, shrimp, seafood platter. Um, the next day, we uh, went to Algiers. We spent time in Algiers, pretty cool coffee shop there. D-Rob and Pam took a trip to New Orleans uh, last January, I think it was, or two Januaries ago. And uh, because D-Rob roasts his own coffee and he would love to do the same thing there, uh, he talked to some coffee roasters in New Orleans and kind of got a lay of the land and heard what the coffee culture is like out there. People there need good coffee. They need a good church and good coffee. So uh, we went to the West Bank and took the ferry. That's the picture you see on the right. We took the ferry across the Mississippi River uh, to get to the French Quarter area downtown. You can go to the next slide. It's a couple shots of the city from the water. Next slide. Uh, in downtown, you have Cafe Du Mont. If you go to New Orleans, that's a staple. Uh, the beignets, which are French donuts covered in powdered sugar. Um, whole team got to experience that. I think Micah ate his weight in beignets, um, <laughs> made multiple stops at Cafe Du Monde while we were walking around. So that was sweet. We got to just see what the, the city was like, sort of the heart of the city there in the French Quarter, um, walked around for you know, probably a few hours, a couple hours, touring that. Uh, there's a French market there where vendors set up and sell things that they make. That was a, a part of that time on, uh, on Friday, pretty much all day. After we left uh, downtown, you can go to the next, next slide. Uh, that's a shot of St. Louis Cathedral just across from where we were in the previous pictures, eating beignets. That's right across the street in uh, Jackson Square. Next slide. People playing music on the street, that's super common. Uh, some of the, the folks remarked as we were walking around that before you're out of earshot of one band, you hear another one. Just the culture there. It's our, our group in the middle of uh, 
of downtown in the French Quarter still. Next slide. Uh, that night, on Friday night, we uh, visited Lil Dizzy's, uh, which is a restaurant in uh, the Treme neighborhood. Um, this place actually let us come in and kind of hosted us for a, a private dinner. Uh, D-Rob set that up. And um, because they got so much business from the uh, promotion from one of uh, Mark Ween's videos on his uh, food channel, they got so much business that when they realized that D-Rob was a family, they let us come in, they shut the restaurant down during normal closing hours, and uh, we got to meet with uh, what had become some sweet relationships with the uh, pastors at NOLA Baptist in New Orleans. Um, so that's them there on the, the lower part of the picture. Uh, we just got to talk to them about church planting, what, what things are like for them. Uh, they've been in it for a decade. You know, they've survived those initial uncertain years. And so we got to hang out with them, hear from them and their wives uh, over a good meal. So that was Friday. Saturday, uh, we, the next day, we went to District Donuts. Kind of the whole itinerary centered around food, as you can tell. Um, you know, we planned where we wanted to eat and then decided what else we were going to do. That, what you're looking at, probably was my favorite food. I mean, it's close between that and the oysters, but on, the two pictures on the right, uh, hot honey chicken biscuit is what that is. And then on the left, a uh, cinnamon roll I could feed a family of three. Uh, we, on Saturday, after breakfast, we toured New Orleans East. You can go to the next slide. The first stop was this donut bakery that uh, I know we left. Nobody was hungry. <laughs> But we had to squeeze this in anyway. Um, they have the best donuts, at least in America. I haven't had donuts outside of here, so can't speak for that. But maybe in the world, definitely in the country. Um, we spent, this is in New Orleans East. And, you know, between the, the two vehicles, we all just drove around. Uh, New Orleans East, uh, looking at different neighborhoods, looking at different homes, uh, talking about what might be where we want to live, where we want to uh, look for a building, those kinds of things uh, to meet. So we spent some hours doing that. Uh, then lunchtime, still no one's hungry. Uh, we went to Castnet. Next slide. Um, this is a, a seafood spot uh, that I grew up with uh, right down the street. So you could literally see the street that this building is on if you stood in the street in front of my house where I grew up. So we uh, ate lunch there and then did some more touring of, uh, of New Orleans East before we went back to the place that we were staying at uh, where we hosted uh, some locals. So some friends of mine, um, you can go to the next slide. That's us eating again. Um, that's D-Rob losing at the game we're playing. <laughs> Uh, we, we hosted uh, some New Orleanians. That's in, on the left side of the picture, Nick and his wife standing up holding my son, uh, Angel. They uh, live in a further part of the city, not particularly close to the east. But uh, Nick graduated from the Master's University, their biblical counseling program. 
So that's where I met him. We were in class doing introductions during my second summer at the college, and he mentioned that he was from New Orleans. And so that's how we met. Uh, we've, we've kept in touch. When we visited New Orleans in the past, we stayed with them, and their, their family has, have become dear friends. Uh, and you can go to the next slide. The, this is uh, Candace. So interesting story here. Candace contacted our church uh, through Facebook. I was uh, actually up late preparing something uh, for an equipping hour, I think, some months ago. And her message popped up where she was asking, this is a, a Saturday night in the wee hours of the morning. She wanted to know, hey, are you guys uh, planted already? Or do you have, are you planting soon? Or is this some years out from now? I heard your church was planting a church in New Orleans. And so finding out uh, the way she learned about the New Orleans church plant and what we're doing is from another local church who heard about that in Phoenix. And so it's a roundabout way that she came to find this out. But God recently saved her um, out of some really uh, bad teaching. Uh, and when he saved her, she found messages online for another local church here in the valley, and they told her about us. And so she's still in New Orleans, um, might be moving soon uh, out of the city somewhere else, but for now she's there, and we got to spend some time with her. It was super sweet to see uh, Diana, this older woman, intentional. Uh, even in the couple hours that we were there uh, just having dinner together, she's uh, started playing the role of an older woman already uh, in, in her life, just as she's had opportunity. So that was a sweet night. Um, and, and I think just one of the things that as we uh, spent time together, that was just a sweet aspect of the entire trip. You know, the food was great, but even better than the food was just the fellowship and, and being able to be in close proximity with each other 24-7. Uh, it was conflict-free. Certainly that won't be the testimony of the entire life of the church once we plant, but it was a, a really sweet time and gave us some glimpses of uh, things to look forward to in the future. Our last day there was uh, Sunday. On Sunday, we went to service uh, at NOLA Baptist. Uh, we, they had a Sunday school uh, early in the morning. We went there and uh, then went to the service. So that's the outside of the building you're looking at on the left. They meet in uh, a warehouse that, some sort of shipping warehouse, and uh, the owner's giving them space to meet as a church, and that is what their uh, front looks like on the, on the right. Um, the music team stands up on that little stage back there. I think it was three or four people. Three people, and then the keyboardist on the left, and... You can see uh, the table set up for communion and a sermon. Pretty simple, pretty basic, and uh, that's how they do it. It's uh, fun to, to think a little bit about how we might look in, in early days, you know, strip away the comfy chairs and the carpet, the big stage sound system. You know, maybe we, maybe we look something like that in, in the beginning days and that's where God begins to do his work. Who knows? After we uh, left service, I think some pictures on the next slide of us outside the building, guys, gals. After this, we, uh, of course, had to eat. Went to uh, Parkway Subs, is it, which is the next slide. That's uh, the last picture that we all took together before we left the city. And uh, we dropped 
the people who flew in off of the airport and then almost drove through the night to get back to, to Phoenix. Uh, we decided once we were about 30 minutes outside of uh, Houston that we were going to just not spend the night at my parents' house. We were just going to nap for an hour or two and then hit the road again. So that's what we did, eager to see our families after about a week out of town. And so that's, uh, that's a little bit about our trip. Some, some takeaways that the, the folks who went have shared is uh, it's just a normal city. That was, that was significant for several people who went. It's just a normal city. Uh, if you Googled New Orleans and just read the headlines, you would be appalled and you would think, man, it's like a war zone out there. It's not. That, that happens at times. It's uh, lots of violent crimes in the city. Um, depending on how you divide the numbers, if you divide just the numbers of violent crimes, I think the city ranked somewhere around six. It's usually in the top 10 just on the sheer numbers of violent crimes. But if you factor in numbers of violent crimes per capita, per person living there, then it's something like 25. So not as bad as you would think. But it is just a normal city. Um, I think it was um, Ryan Reed who said, who mentioned that and just said, you know, the, the same things that are happening there happen here. It's not, it's not extraordinary in that way. Uh, being with the people on the core team was more fun than being in the city, somebody said. Uh, actually being in the city for the first time eliminated fears of going for some people. Uh, and I can say for certain that everyone who went left with a greater realization of the need for the gospel and a need for a church. And so that's, uh, that, was, that was an answer to prayer, is that in being there, People would embrace the, the need that people would grow in their zeal for this work. And uh, that ha has happened early on in the process. And so now that we're back here, having not left yet, uh, the goal is to ensure that GBC is, is stable, that all the ministries that currently happen here at Grace Bible Church can continue happening well, uh, and this church continues going strong so that we can take portions of our body and replant them. Right? That means in Gilbert, this church has to be strong to do that. In New Orleans, same thing. This church has to be strong to uh, continue reproducing itself. Uh, if you thought if you're thinking about ways uh, that you can serve, ways that you can meet the needs to make this happen, I don't, if you ask the other elders, I don't know what the elders would say. You know, each, each man might have a slightly different uh, take, but I can say for sure what's important to all of us, the greatest need is the holy lives of people who can be entrusted with, with ministry. Um, in this church, to plant a church anywhere, especially to, we need older women who are eagerly pouring into younger women, who are helping younger women learn how to love their husbands, be good lovers of their children, to be good workers at home. We need older women who are doing those things, which means that you older women have to be growing in wisdom, have to be growing in godliness, and have to be growing in knowledge to teach the older women these things so that older women can leave this church and there's not a vacuum. Older men, we need you pouring into the young husbands, younger dads, training them, teaching them how to do what's necessary to raise a family, to be a, a leader in the church. 
We need older men to be pouring into younger men, teaching them how to be sensible, which means you have to be practicing sensibility. You have to be practicing uh, walking in such a way that your faith is imitatable so that we can take some of those young men, possibly some of those older men, we can plant them elsewhere, and there's not a vacuum left here in those ways. Um, in each church, think in Gilbert, you think New Orleans, um, there are ministry responsibilities that have to get carried out. Uh, Josh and the elders going on, uh, the leaders going with that church plant can't do all of the work necessary to make a ministry run. In New Orleans, I and whatever other leaders uh, come to be a part of that work can't do all of the things that make a ministry run. But whoever participates and leads in other significant ways has to have the character to do it has to have a clarity about what the church must be and must do. And so we need those things from the members of the church. That's primarily how you can contribute, either by being that here or being that somewhere else. And so as you think about how to help these uh, significant plants, these significant works get off the ground, be thinking in that way. Um, even you young people, who have much more availability, you play a significant role in contributing your time and effort and resources to making sure that God's name and truth are upheld in the world. We can all do that together. Let me know if you have any other questions beyond that. We'd love to talk to you more. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for uh, these people at GBC that you brought here. Uh, thank you for the ways that men and women are laboring tirelessly to exalt you. I pray that this would only continue more and more as uh, the day of Christ's coming draws near, that you would fill us with an unquenchable desire to see your fame spread far and wide. Help us to be holy, to be sincere to possess pure hearts and good consciences to that end. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.